Video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SIGOT's pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. A very good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to all our Pioneer Fan Club members joining us on this 72nd webinar on SICOT Pioneer. Um, today's webinar marks over 103,000 views on our SICOT Pioneer platform, and we would very much be grateful if you continue to be with us on this virtual journey. Today's webinar is a collaboration between the SICOT HIP Committee and the IOA. We're very thankful for this collaboration, and the title of today's webinar is Total Hip Replacements in the Complex Estabulum. Now, moderating today's um, webinar is our very own hip and knee arthroplasty senior consultant and also the sectional head of the hip committee, Nicolas Restrepo, uh, who is from the University uh, of Granada in Colombia. Um, he was also the past president of the Colombian Society of Orthopedic Traumatology, uh, and he's our SICOT Hip Arthroplasty Committee Chair. And our co-chair for today is Dr. Sharma, Brinal Sharma, who is the head of orthopedics at the Amrita Hospital in Faridabad, India. He's also our SICOT Hip Arthroplasty Committee member and SICOT Research Awards Committee member. Now, we would very much like your continuous engagement with this webinar. So please post your comments and questions as the webinar goes by and the moderators as well as speakers will try and address them continuously. And of course, please do follow us on demand as our webinars are all posted on the website and we would like you to continue with us on this virtual journey. And on that note, thank you once again for joining us today. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you, Bo. It's a pleasure for me to do this combined uh, webinar with uh, the Indian Orthopedic Association and with Mirna. Mirna, thank you and all of you. Uh, we present right now the first talk is about our vice president, uh, Marco Ezekiel, who want to talk about uh, acetabular fractures with pelvic discontinuity. Thank you, Marco. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Also, a very warm welcome from my side. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yes. So very warm, warm welcome. Well, not so warm because it's from Germany, but it's okay. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about acetabular fractures with uh, pelvic discontinuity. So I'm going to start with uh, some introduction, um, an overview, then a case a report, uh, some literature, and a take-home message. So the classifications of acetabular defects or acetabular fractures, there are different classifications, as you well know. I'm going to focus on the WAOS defect classification type 4 in this talk, or from the Paprosky classification, the type um, 3A and B, where we have a pelvic discontinuity. So what do we do in these cases? We have a large number of uh, possible implants 
on the market for um, for these uh, problems. We have press fit cups, we have screw cups, cemented cups, revision cups, tantalum components, bone grafts, jumbo cups, augments, socket cups, custom made implants. So what kind of implants do we use? So first of all, it's important to know that for a good acetabular component uh, fixation, the subchondral bone uh, beneath the anterior inferior iliac spine is mandatory to have a good bone quality and also uh, in the dorsal inferior part of the ischium. If these two parts are not well, uh, if, if the bone there is fractured or there is not a, a good bone quality, then you have uh, problems with the fixation of a normal press fit or bigger cup. So the two main goals of reconstruction is first a reconstruction of the center of rotation, that's clear, but second also to have a stability of the acetabular component that is very mandatory in these cases. So just for you to, to know, we have some corridors for the screw placement. We have the anterior corridor marked with A, we have the gluteal corridor, we have the sciatic buttress corridor, we have the ischial corridor, and we have the Ramos osis pubis corridor. So we have to see what kind of situation we have. Either it's necessary to do a CT scan before to see uh, how the situation is in your specific case. I'm gonna show you a case of pelvic discontinuity with uh, a custom made implant. It's an 83 year old lady, it's a female, three previous operations with acetabular rev revisions, severe pain, she could only walk a short distance it was mainly in the wheelchair. So these were the, the images. So you can see that we have a large uh, central defect and also uh, a pelvic discontinuity in this case. So in these cases, we go for a custom-made implant. We have a CT scan before, and if you look a little bit closer on the CT scan, you can see very well that the two areas that are very mandatory for having a good cup fixation, they are very, very poor bone in this case. So we have no really subchondral bone beneath uh, the anterior inferior iliac spine. And also we have a very poor bone quality in the ischium and the posterior inferior acetabulum. So this is the, the kind of implant that we use in these cases. We um, rather go for a central fixation uh, with a kind of ilium bolt, like uh, the socket technique. And uh, the, there is a very nice plan always provided. This is the example of the implant in the operation room. Uh, there is also a very nice thing that you can get a 3D printed uh, implant so that you can um, really uh, visualize and also uh, reconstruct in your head the defect that you have in the patient. So first of all, we start with the placement of the implant. Then uh, the, the, the most important step is you can see here, there is one or two screws already fixated the implant. But if, if you really prepare it very well, you have a good, uh, a good uh, impaction of the implant. Then uh, the, the, the most important part is to have in, the both, um, in both planes a good fixation of the ilium bolt. And uh, this is uh, the central ilium bolt that we insert. And after that, you can uh, uh, put all the other screws into the other corridors that are needed. You can see here uh, the, the, the fixation of the rest of the implant. Uh, in revision cases, we always use a um, dual mobility uh, solution to, to reduce uh, the risk of dislocation. In this case, a cemented uh, dual mobility implant. And then uh, the use of uh, adapters for the stem that was inserted um, to have this dual mobility solution. So here you can see the, re the final result um, in this uh, case of pelvic discontinuity. And uh, I hope the video is running. This is the patient um, 10 or 12 days after surgery. So the most important thing in my opinion in these cases is that you have a good um, um, mobilization of the patient that you have a stable uh, fixation and that they can walk with full weight bearing directly after the operation because in most of the case, cases these patients are old patients and uh, we need to take, uh, put them out of bed uh, fast. 
So this is the result after uh, three months control. So the literature, what does the literature say? So we have um, different uh, things. Well, first of all, we have uh, some papers that show that there is a high accuracy uh, um, implanting these kind of implants when you have the CT scan not more than three months uh, prior to the operation. So we have a high accuracy in the placement. Uh, we have um, a rather high dislocation rate in this review. You can see in, in some cases up to 30%. So it's a little bit unclear what kind of uh, bearings were used. So I think that uh, if we use more and more dual mobility solutions in revision surgery, I think also in these cases we can reduce the dislocation rate so that we have to be aware in these kind of patients. And uh, we have also um, uh, good uh, PROMs uh, shown in this, uh, in this nice uh, study with a two-year follow-up of large acetabular defects with and without pelvic discontinuity. So there's a uh, fourth dimension. This is not. This is a German company, uh, Link. I, you you should know uh, it. They, they're working on uh, showing uh, the bone thickness and bone quality in the CT. So these data, these data is um, extracted from the CT scan. And I think with with these kind of uh, of uh, CT, we can have a, 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 um, even better. A placement of the screws, and we know where uh, to place uh, the uh, the main uh, force of the implant. So I'm come to the end. A take home message: We have a stable fixation in complex acetabular fractures with pelvic discontinuity with these kind of implants. In my opinion, it's a very big uh, advantage that it's a monoblock implant that can combine different design elements of reconstruction of the acetabulum. You have to be well aware of the corridors of fixation that we have and where the, uh, the implant has to be fixed. Uh, the literature shows uh, good results in accuracy and prompts and mobilization, but still a high dislocation rate. And the preoperative bone quality assessment can help, in my opinion, in the future to uh, um, find the right fixation. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for your questions. Thank you, Marco. Good talk. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Mirnal? Yeah, Marco. Yes. For the, for the benefit of our younger colleagues, uh, can you tell us a, a radiological indicator on a plain X-ray of pelvis with both hips that shows that probably this might be pelvic discontinuity? Uh, to see it only on the, on the, on the X-ray, you, you mean? So do you do you have any indicators which can tell on a plane? Uh, well, yeah, there is. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the the thumb rule where you can when you can see that they're uh, uh, in the in the uh, lower part of the ischium uh, when there that indicates you that you have a, a insufficient posterior column of the acetabulum. So this is one uh, one sign. And uh, of course, when you have like a central discontinuity, then you have to be aware that in the in the anterior part of the acetabulum, you also have a very poor bone quality, and you rather should go for a, a stable fixation. Thank you, Marco Mirnal. Uh, in order of time, uh, please, I I going to uh, give the, the word to you to introduce myself to the next talk. Sure. Mm, so. The next talk is going to be by Nicholas, and he's going to speak about total hip arthroplasty in failed fixations after trauma of the acetabulum. Um, over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Bernal. Uh, are you seeing my, my screen? Yes, yes. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> the acetabular fracture, probably it's 10% uh, of all pelvic fractures, and it's uh, for sure a high energy trauma with often fracture dislocations that uh, create more problems. The complications, usually we can have a post-traumatic osteoarthritis, a vascular necrosis like this one, heterotopic ossification. We don't have seen uh, too much in my country, but there's a lot in other countries. Sharing nerve palsy and infection it runs probably almost to 5%. Uh, now that we have eaten it, what we have to do, the first time that I recommend is an adequate planning. The, 
you need to uh, see all all your acetone or your fracture. Uh, what hardware do you have? If you need to remove some, or do you need to remove anything? Yeah. Uh, and now you have to select the approach. Uh, the select approach is in order to the hardware removal and the implant that you need to select to cover your better your hip arthroplasty. Even if it's a primary, you will need uh, other things like Marco told us, a custom made, a uh, pre flange, and other things. What approach? Uh, it, it's, it's recommended that if you work in a university team or in a hospital, good experience surgeon must be in charge of this, these fractures. There's no place to minimal invasive surgery. And the approach is probably the one that you usually perform. Otherwise, if you don't perform, if you are used only anterior and you need to remove some uh, hardware for posterior, it's, uh, it's better that you look for help and go with you are with a, an experienced guide to do this approach. And you need to change your approach only if the situation requires it, yeah? I have the 30 minutes rule. If it takes more than 30 minutes to remove it, please do it in two stages. It increases the infection, it increases the teratopic ossification, all the complications. And it's better to remove uh, explain the, pa the patient before to go to the surgery that is difficult and probably it will be in two in two stage and there's no problem. That's the case. Uh, it's difficult to get uh, some screws and I need to remove it from the acetabulum in order to avoid the, the the frictions and I prefer to remove it and then I do a hypertroplasty like one. If you are in doubt an infection, that please do it also in two stage. In these patients, we don't have, we are not sure that uh, there's not infection. The uh, it's a, BC, a, a BCA and RCP uh, elevated, and uh, when I try to punction, doesn't work. It doesn't fix anything, and I prefer to remove it. I uh, put in a spacer, and once uh, I can remove, for example, this, and once I can do it, I put the. Uh, original uh, primary hip arthroplasty. And the other things is a good tip is remove only what you need. If the screws that protrude through the acetabulum, uh, like in the previous uh, screen, it's better to remove it. And you can, in same cases, uh, you must be uh, with an image guided percutaneously to remove uh, only the screw posterior if you are not accustomed to the posterior approach. And leave the plates. You can leave the plates, like in this case, uh, if there's no protruding or this is not uh, near to the acetabulum. What about the implant selection? There's a lot of options according to the age, the damage, the bone quality, and according to the stability. For example, in this case, you have to remove all that people put inside. Uh, and the requirements are non negotiable. You have to put a good fixation for a long time. And the, uh, the acetabulum must be settled in the host bone, trying to correct the offset, the length discrepancy, and you have different ones. This is one, it's debatable, but we can discuss later. It's debatable for elder people, ACA3 or more, with a lot of hardware to remove. It's better to put a cemented cup without removal anything and put a, a, a good part of cement and making uh, some uh, screws perforations to in, uh, increase the, the fixation, the cement fixation. The usual one is select the approach, the, as I told you, one or versus two stage removal, bring your acetabulum and please bone graft if you need or in doubt to cover metal or to avoid corrosions. In this, that is the case, I put some metal and I impact it and the screws uh, are not in, in contact with the, with the cup. And you have to do a good press fit if you don't have good press fit, you have to put a, a screws for sure. In this case, it's uh, for a gunshot. Uh, we don't have to remove it, but yeah, I prefer to, to uh, clean very well and put the screws. In this case, for example, you have to put a graft and leave a screw. In this case, I leave the screw. And the difficult ones is select approach. As I told you, one versus two stage removal. For example, this is the cases, difficult cases. Mm -hmm. And the one is you must to stabilize your acetabulum. 
descend it and restore it to the offset. Please put bone graft and anything is, is you needed. Trabecular versus high metal, porous metal is, is, is the best option. And you go to the, to the OR with cases just in case. In this case, it's a big defect. You have to put uh, uh, a trabecular metal hemispherical uh, augments, for example. And this is the case when I uh, prefer to remove only the hardware that it go inside and put another things. Bone graft and anything else, yeah, in this case, I add a vancomycin to my a bone grafts. And in some case, I put phosphate, a calcium phosphate with any antibiotics just in case. That's our cases specific. And the difficult ones, as I told you, trabecular versus high porous metal and cases, you have to go to the cases. It's good to put the case, put more bone grafts inside to restore the offset and the acetabulum. The take-home message is the total hip arthroplasty after failed acetabular osteosynthesis is challenging. More complication and more in younger people, you have to plan your approach and select the removal versus one or two stages. Decide your fixations, cemented versus uncemented, and go out with all options, augments, cage, and all the things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, anyone wants to ask any question to Nicholas? Dr. Rajiv? Uh, yes, sir. And, and Nicholas, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Now, your, you, your tips and tricks uh, to fix the, uh, the ischial screw that I saw in one of your, your x-ray, the inferior yeah. screw fixation. Yeah, yeah uh, Jory, you are in top with the fixation. It's, it's a good it's, it's a good question. It's, uh, you have to fix the, the screw. Uh, I have problems right now in with some with some companies that uh, the the multi hole cup, uh, cups are not good for the the ischial screws, uh, and you have to select it exactly the cup that binds and and adjust to this one. Just in case, as I told you, I go with caches, and it's in doubt. I put the cache and put a dual mobility cup inside the cache. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, let's move in order to be on time. Uh, we're going to talk uh, and Oliver, our past president of the CICOT and the vice president right now of the CICOT. We're going to talk about the total, uh, a difficult case in operative practice with pelvic discontinuity, not seen in surgery. Go ahead, Oliver. Thank you so much. Uh, turn on your now, micro. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's okay. Thanks. Sorry okay. about that. So, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you this uh, case. It's, it's not a very common case, and I hope you enjoy that. So, this is the case uh, that is called intraoperative fracture with pelvic discontinuity not seen at surgery. This is my disclosure. And this is the case. This is a 38, 39 years old lady that comes at nearly at midnight. Uh, with this uh, fall down in at subway, with this uh, she has a, a Down syndrome, but was independent for daily activities and lived with her mother who is eighty, and he has a bilateral total hip uh, replacement. This is the case. This is an anterior dislocation, and this is the lady with this uh, situation. So we try to do a close reduction, but it was very difficult. We need a traction table to get them the, the the head inside the acetabulum. But we did it, and then the the patient was uh, comes to the clinic, uh, and he sh he showed uh, limping and trembling positive and some kind of sound like a pop up sound and and wear an abduction brace. This is the 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 X axial view. This is the CT that uh, show a correct component orientation, but six weeks later, the patient comes with another anterior dislocation. So we reduced very easily in this in that time and it was uh, unstable in 90 degrees of flexion and 40 external rotation and extension these are the component that the patient came with the surgical report in the previous surgery from another hospital this is a modular uh, stem with a, a modular neck and a acetabular liner with a 10 degrees polyethylene this is the 
X-ray after the last uh, reduction. I mean, uh, Andy has another third anterior dislocation in that case uh, with a close relation again. So the patient is coming every six weeks with a dislocation. And we propose the patient to uh, do a revision surgery for this instability. But the patient and the family reject that. Remember, it's a Down syndrome, uh, that no uh, low, uh, high demand with a, 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 a habitual um, uh, people who take care of her, that is an 80 old year lady. But 12 weeks later, another dislocation. This is the fourth one. So uh, we propose uh, again surgery, the, the patient and the family reject again. We explain everything. And this is the patient walking at this 12 weeks with a brace. This is the same walk that the patient has before uh, these four uh, times uh, this location. So the patient previously has a low demand and with this limping and this trendelable sign. So this is the patient. And uh, finally, we convinced the family and the patient about surgery. You can see how the retrocanter was uh, fractured. All the abductor mechanism was with the fracture of the great trochanter. And this is the impingement area with a wear of the polyethylene, the posterior part is a posterior approach. And how the patient is located with this uh, uh, impingement in neck. And also we remove this uh, polyethylene from the from this surgery. You can see how the impingement create this wear in the posterior part of the liner. This is a very nice view of what is happening in this patient with this uh, this uh, impingement and this fulcrum to dislocate anterior. This is after removal of the acetabular component with the is set out uh, removal uh, tool. This is a very nice anterior, posterior, and superior view of this acetabulum. And this is the component that we use. We use a dual mobility in very small acetabulum. It was 48 with a dual mobility um, component. And this is a trial and the final test without uh, fixation of the acetabulum, I mean the trochanter. So you can see a very stable uh, situation without the acetabulum, in, I mean the trochanter in place. So we need to fix it, uh, do the fixation of the, of the trochanter area at the end. But it was very stable with this dual mobility and there is no dislocation, no anterior dislocation and no posterior dislocation. So we reattach the, the trochanter area and trochanter fracture with all the uh, abductor mechanism with uh, sutures. Don't use any plate in that case. And this is the postoperative x-ray of this uh, lady. You can see here we have an increase on the length of 1.4 uh, centimeters. And this is the patient four weeks after surgery. So you can see how the patients can walk uh, with the same limping as she has before without crutches. The patient was very happy with the surgery, but I was not so happy with the x-ray. So as you can see in the x-ray, there is a pelvic discontinuity as, 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 as I was mentioned in the previous talks. And we propose the family and the patient uh, surgery. We need to fix this pelvic discontinuity at any way. But the family don't want to go to the OR again. So I check the patient a few weeks later, 12 weeks after surgery. So you can see here how the patient 12 weeks, three months after surgery. And you can see the x-ray, how this pelvic discontinuity increased a little bit, but the patient was working without crutches and doing the previous activity that he, he she used to do. And this is the, the actual view. And uh, we do a CT where you can see how huge uh, uh, distance between uh, the acetabulum, the upper part of the acetabulum and the and the pubic and the other part of the of the acetabulum in figure one. And, uh, and this was 16 uh, weeks post-operative. So I continue talking with the family and the patient, going to the OR, but the patient reject. So at this point, I would like to ask you guys what to do. I mean, what is your opinion of what to do in this situation? Remember, the, the, the social situation of the of the patient. The patient love uh, football and go to the to the stadium every weekend. So he's doing the the, the previous uh, uh, quality of life. So, Rajiv, what do you do? We cannot hear you. Can you unmute? Don't you mind? Uh, yeah. th thank you. Uh, if, if I look at this cup, there is a there is no contact on the inferior side. Uh, so my uh, take will be that uh, this probably will fail in time and probably will need a cup cage. 
Okay, Mirnal, quick answer. Yeah, I think um, I agree with Dr. Rajiv. Uh, this needs to be built up. This this country cannot continue. You will fail. Uh, Marco, I would go for a custom made implant. I know it's a yeah. it's a thing. Yeah. It's a, here, you know, in Germany, we it's it's provided by the insurance, so it's not. Uh, not a problem. Probably, yeah. Okay, a cup and cage is also possible, but I would. Uh, you need you need a stable fixation of of the pelvis. Yeah. Remember that the patient and the family don't want to go to the OR, so that's one of the questions. Yeah. Dana Sekara wants to add something. Yeah, Dana Dana Sekara. So I had a similar patient, but it was not, not so much distracted like this. So I left it to uh, heal conservatively. So the cup got inter integrated with the dome. There's minimal gap inferior to the cup, but still worked. But it's grossly distracted. It needs to be fixed, and then a uh, uh, cup cage construct should be used. Okay. Nico? Uh, I agree with Marco. Uh, both both uh, options are fine. But uh, just to discuss, uh, it's working like a McMean cup, <laughs> like a, like a, uh, like a, uh, oncology cup with with a big screw uh, and it's working it is working for, for 16 uh, weeks uh i'm not so uh, uh worried about to uh, wait a little bit more and uh, told all the patient the patient and the family that for sure it's going to fail and it's going to fail we have to do it with more problems with more hardware and that thing I completely agree with all of you. Maybe a custom-made implant, as, as Marco uh, showed us, will be the best option. But um, sometimes uh, the, my hospital is a public hospital, and uh, it's very difficult to convince sometimes uh, these kind of people. So I, this was one year after surgery. The patient doesn't want to go to the OR. These are the x-rays. The patient is doing the same quality of life as we have shown before us for uh, four months. Dale. And this is five year follow up. So you can see here oh, yeah. Yeah. how the patient is working five years post operative. So I agree with all of you. I mean, you need to fix these cases, you need to do surgery. But remember that sometimes we have to individualize this kind of cases uh, with the patient, the family, and all around. I'm sorry about that. This is not a great surgery or revision surgery, but it's another case that maybe uh, you will enjoy and you can think about that. So I will see you in, in Belgrade, and thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Oliver. Excellent, excellent case. Uh, uh, we're going to continue with Mirnal. Mirnal is uh, our co-moderator, and we're talking about the total hypertroplasty in neglected fractures and fracture dislocation of the stabulum. Go ahead, Mirnal, and thank you. Thank for you, Nicole. This thank webinar. you, Sikot, for giving me this opportunity. You can see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Fine. So, we know neglected acetabulum fractures can be seen if they are conservatively managed, inadequately treated, or you can see them as complications with the AVN and secondary OA, or they might have been operated with late complications developing, leading to pain, limb shortening, stiffness, contractures, and even shortening nerve palsies. Mm -hmm. We need to preoperatively plan these with investigations of uh, CT scans, X-ray pelvis, Jude views to see whether there is a non-union incarcerated fragments, hardware encroachment, and bone defects. And you can use approaches. I usually use cockle Langenbach, but you might need extensile and ileo-inguinal or even stopa as approaches in some cases. The bone defect management needs to be, uh, you know, very, very uh, in a flowchart way protocol based. Uh, contained defects, impaction bone grafting, small and uncontained, you can use jumbo porous coated cups, large uncontained defects, more than 2.5 centimeters. You might need femoral head autografts or augments if needed. Larger defects might need to be reconstructed with bone grafting and cages. And the discontinuity, which has been covered, we might need cup cage, custom flange, or plating with bone grafting and a multiple revision cup. So Mayers has classified these into circumstantial defects, where a simple dislocation with the fracture maybe initially was close reduced, but developed uh, osteoarthritis and a simple uh, large porous coated cup sufficed. And these can be treated in a very conservative way. In you know, contained defects like the central fracture acetabulum, which have been old, you know, you just need to go inside. The approach is going to be extensile and you need.
you know, uh, approach every case differently. Uh, if there is a posterior wall or a column fragment, you might have an ileoischial line which might be displaced, but continuous, it might be malunion, or type B might be the one which might be not non-continuous and there might be non-union. So you have a posterior four Ps in a posterior fracture dislocation of the acetabulum, posterior deficiency, posterior migration of the hip center, persistent subluxation, and posterior column non-union. So this is a case of neglected acetabulum fracture where you can see there is a posterior superior defect which was reconstructed by a uh, femoral head autograft and buttressed with a plate. You can also use screws going into the towards the sacral -like joint. And I did a cemented total hip arthroplasty uh, and it buttressed that uh, fragment. This is another case where total hip arthroplasty and neglected fracture dislocation with neck of femur was done. And the patient kept walking and it created a posterior superior defect again. I used impaction grafting, protected it with a mesh, fixed it with screws. And this is the final outcome after an uncemented cup. So transverse fractures is another possibility which you can see in T-type transverse posterior column fractures, both anterior and posterior column with or posterior with hemi-transverse fractures. Here, both the ilio and ilio lines are displaced. You might have a type A with non-union where bone grafting a large porous coated cup might suffice or type B might be the ones with malunion and pelvic discontinuities which has been discussed. So this is a simple case where a fracture acetabulum has gone into malunion and a simple uh, you know, approach with a total hip arthroplasty, 74 year old, a cemented hip has been done and the patient is walking fine. Another case, non-union, 56 year female, six months old, injury, fall from height, conservatively managed, comes to me with a non-union. You can see the huge defect there. And this is the CT scan showing the defect. And this needs to be reconstructed. You know, the posterior superior defect needs to be curated out, bone grafted, and a multi-hole porous coated cup sufficed in this case. The head was used as an autograph to build up the um, the acetabular floor. So this is the final outcome of the patient. Now, you would also have cases where you would have anterior column fractures. They might be alone. They might be with the posterior hemitransfers or both columns where they need to be fixed, actually. The iliopectinal line is displaced in such cases. Impaction bone grafting, cemented, uncemented cups might suffice. This case looked like an infection to me, but there was no signs of infection. The count CSR and CRP were normal. Estabulum fracture with fract neck of femur impacted. Patient kept walking, came to me with the anterior iliopectinal line displaced there, uh, anterior column fracture. I did a cemented total hip arthroplasty. It was almost more than 65. So Liu et al. classified these dislocations and fracture dislocation to three types. With type A, you know, the blue in this uh, image is the not native acetabulum and the black one is the pseudo acetabulum. So in type A, the native acetabulum is intact and pseudo acetabulum does not encroach onto the acetabulum. In type B1 and B2, the, the pseudo acetabulum actually encroaches onto the uh, original acetabulum and it might, you know, invade it in to create a posterior superior defect. In type B2, the general acetabulum is atrophied and the pseudo acetabulum does not actually encroach onto the anterior inferior wall. And in a type C, which is the severest form, I'll show you the examples. The whole of the pseudo acetabulum encroaches onto the original acetabulum. So this is an example of a type of neglected hip dislocation with fracture in a 50-year-old male RTA. He kept walking on this for two years and came to me with shortening. And this is, you can see the hip is totally out. The original acetabulum was, you know, filled up with the remnants of the femoral head and I could reconstruct it because the walls were intact. I went inside, did the reaming, accepted a high hip center, but I could get a 70% post bone contact with the acetabulum. So another case type B1, neglected hip dislocation, straightforward. I could get into the original acetabulum. You can see that there is an uncoverage of the, uh, the porous coated cup, but still 70% contact was there. I could manage without a femoral head autograph. Type C, neglected hip dislocation, patient kept walking for four years on this and a huge defect you can see that the patient came to me. Uh, it's done almost eight or ten years ago by me and I had some allografts which I could procure and put, filled up the defect, used the femoral head to build up the posterior superior wall of the acetabulum and this is the interoperatively, I delineated the original acetabulum build up this posterior superior defects with multiple allografts and femoral head, put in the screws and put in a cemented cup. This is the final outcome. So autographs are recommended. They should be large enough so that they don't revascularize, adequately protected. They, they should be oriented around the stress lines and bulk allografts should be, or autographs should be protected with rings and cages, which Dr. Rajiv is going to discuss. So the key learning points are identify the fracture pattern in, in neglected 
fractures and dislocation, delineate the defect, whether it's a non-union or a malunion, bone graft the defect, reconstruct the defect with plates, rings, cages, pre-plan the implant to be used, keep everything ready because sometimes you might be surprised with the pelvic discontinuity which might have gone, uh, might have been missed on the previous x-rays or CT scans by you and keep every armamentarium ready on table. There's a beautiful chapter written in my book on hip arthroplasty on neglected hip dislocations, total hip arthroplasty, neglected hip dislocations. The viewers can have a look at that. Thank you. Any questions? I'm ready to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mirnal. Any questions? Sophia, any questions from the audience? Uh, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of time, but if you, from the audience, you can send your questions to Sophia. No chance. Mirna, could you present Dr. Rajiv? Uh, yeah, Dr. Rajiv is going to present next. He is the chair of the Indian Orthopedic Association Arthroplasty Chair. He has been the past president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association as well, a renowned figure in the Indian circle of arthroplasty. I welcome you, Dr. Rajiv, for your talk on augments in cages in vestibular defects. Uh, thank you so much, Mirnal. Th thank you so much, Sikort, uh, Marcus, Oliver, and all friends. Uh, I'll restrict my talk to the uh, to the cups and cages and where you should use the augments and how to use the cup and cage properly. Now, various defects, they really, uh, massive defects, they really pose a very big challenge for fixation. For the understanding purposes, probably it is easy to take up the Paprosky classification. And here the type 2B and C and type 3A and B are the ones where we are, where we need the special devices, and that's what we are going to discuss today. Now, the easy understanding of the uh, defect and what to fix and where, uh, if, the, if the head migration is superiorly and laterally, that means that posterior column is lost. That is a very good indicator. If the migration is superiorly and medially, uh, as Manal was asking in one of, the, one of his uh, questions, the more anterior column is lost. So that could be a very easy way to understand the, the defects in the plain X-ray. The 2A, 2C, uh, 3A, and 3B defects uh, can be in multiple uh, types of this. And how to fix them, how to how to treat them in an adequate way, these are the options for the reconstruction of the estabulum. Uh, jumbo cup, which is uh, the oversized, cementless, porous cup, uh, is a very good option in, in majority of the cases. Reconstruction rings, accepting the higher hip center, bone grafts, double cups, and oblong cups. But the trivicular metal augments probably are the very, very good way to manage most of these defects or the, uh, the cup and cage construct in various forms. That's what we will discuss in the next few slides. The three important points for the, for the cages, the effective for type 2 and 3, where the teardrop license is not there. Obturator, cup, obturator hook is necessary for the, for, the, for the stable component positioning. And primary fixation must not be dependent on the cement. The primary fixation should be of the cage itself. That's one of the examples, 2005, where you have, you see that they say 2B defect. The, this was the, the one of the older type of the cup and cage. This was the octopus cup uh, and cage, uh, which was the fixing up on the periphery. That's what, that's what it was fixed up with a lot of bone graft and, and some bone stimulants as well. That's what the final fixation uh, and uh, the X-ray. And that's what this follow-up of at uh, nine years for this uh, uh, not so so good a, the quality of the, the cage. But the recent cages, which are the uh, cementless cages, are very useful, like the one that used in this case, where you see that there is a there is a defect, uh, the, the 2C type of the defect, the patient walking with difficulty is understandable. And how it is, uh, it is fixed, this is the cup re the removal. And then you see that the, with the fingers, you should have a feeling that what is the uh, amount of the bone that is lost and where you can, you can have a stable fixation. After doing the initial soft reaming, not a very, uh, very uh, heavy reaming, very carefully because there can be a, if you over ream, there can be a pelvic dehiscence. That's what the cage that you, uh, the hook has to fix in the inferior, uh, inferior part. And the uh, two arms that you see, superior arms, can be uh, cut as per the requirement. And the, once the hook is fixed uh, in the teardrop, uh, then you can you can have a, a manipulation to fix the the superior uh, arms 
uh, and and fix it up with the screws. But it's very important that the hook is fixed very strongly and adequately because that is what is what will give the proper stability. And that's what you see the screws being fixed. And all through this process, you should put a put a pressure so that the cage is uh, is uh, pushed uh, medially. And that's what you see. This 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 is a, a strong fixation of the cage. And then you can use the one or two cements, depending upon how big is the defect, how big is the estabulum. Uh, you can use some bone grafts also on the middle side if it is needed. You should put the uh, the finger push the cements uh, adequately. And when this the the cement is ready to accept the cup, uh, that time you can put a uh, put a cup uh, cemented cup uh, in the right orientation. And once you do it. Then you see that uh, this, these patients can be allowed to bear weight in a very easy way. Uh, one must remove the excess of cement because otherwise, at a later time, it will be difficult to remove the excess cement. And once you fix the cup uh, in a in a stronger way, you see that uh, the cement will will take up very well and remove the excess uh, uh, weeping cement. Uh, for give give a constant pressure till the time the cement is setting. And remove the excess cement. That's what you see the X-ray of this patient, and that's what you see the patient uh, is able to stand, bear weight, and walk within a period of uh, one month. The uh, another example uh, where you have a, a massive defect uh, medially, you see the similar cage fixation, and that's what you see. Um, the type C defect, which can be a very difficult fixation, like what you see here. Here, there are two issues, how to fix the cup and how to remove this, this already the prior cup. The important is that when you remove this kind of a intrapelvic cup, you have to be very careful. And in most of these cases, you should have some control on the, on the, uh, on the arteries so that uh, you can have a, a surety that, that you will not damage the arteries uh, during surgery, and if there is a possibility of damage, you are able to manage the bone loss, the, the, the blood loss, and uh, and take the help of your vascular surgeons with you. And once you remove this kind of cup, you see that you will find that there is a very large medial defect, or like, like in this case. Now, this is the example of a cementless cage uh, where you are uh, fixing up the trials and having uh, being sure that how this cup is going to be to be positioned and how it is to be molded before the surgery, before the final fixation. And then you have to mold the cup in the same form as the trial cage. And then you have a fixation uh, in, the, uh, in the, to save the time, I'll just forward the, uh, the uh, video. And once you fix this cup, uh, you first you give the initial fixation uh, with the peripheral screws, superior screws, and then you can put some kind of, kind of a bone grafts on the middle wall so let us remember that these patients may need a, a revision surgery after, say, 10 years, 15 years, or, or 18 years. So if you put a bone graft on the middle side, you will, be, you will build up the middle wall, and that will help in the re-revision surgery in future. That's what you see the fixation uh, of, of this uh, cage. And then you see the bone grafts and uh, bone stimulants uh, added. You should have a good uh, feeling of these bone grafts. And with the finger, then you fix the, the inner dome. You give a torque. And with this torque, this fixation is very, very strong. And then you can have the final uh, poly. Uh, you, can, you can push it in and then final reduction. And that's what you see the fixation uh, of this uh, cage. Okay. And you see this patient walking at three months. Now, this patient, these patients are able to do very well with, with time. Now this, this is what the patient is with the uh, with the with the cementless cage. That's at one year fixation, and that's what the patient is at five years. He still has uh, some amount of limb, but she's able to do very well. That's another example of a uh, of a uh, defect where where the cup has moved superiorly. The cage is fixed, and that's what you see the cage at uh, six years. There's the example of two B defect where you you can use the augments in a very safe way. To fix the augment, you fix the cup first, uh, and then uh, be sure that the you, you know that what kind of augment is going to be fixed. You have to unitize the the augment with the cup with the, with the cup. Without that, probably it will not be right. 
and that's what you see the fixation of the of the temporary fixation of the augment and the fixation of the of the cup and then the proper fixation of the augment you have to use the bone grafts on the on the wall on the back side so that you have a adequate bone uh, available for the repeat surgery whenever it is needed that's what you use the highly porous cup uh, in, in these cases and that's what you have a fixation of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, the cup and the augment and these augments they usually have a very stable uh, uh, situation allowing the patient to have a very comfortable walk in a very short time usually we allow these patients to have a full weight bearing walk in about a month's time that's the follow up of five, five years in these patients that's what you see the one uh, one another case where you have a large defect uh, in the acetabulum and you see the augment is used and that's what you see the fixation now all these patients need to be under close follow up for a very long Unneeded. time and why i say that last last few slides uh, the the cup cage migration is a major issue and this case we saw that there is a patient came after 15 years with this kind of a uh, situation where you know that the reason of the migrated cup has damaged the uh, the iliac arteries and that's what after the uh, the uh, repair of these arteries at one year so careful preoperative planning ct to assess three dimensional anatomy ct angio good assessment of the defect ensure availability of suitable implants 3d printed model is very good in all revisions infection must be ruled out thank you so much thank you dr rajib excellent talk uh, we continue with dr danasekara raja is a good leader of the Indian Society, chair of the Education Committee in Hip and Knee Arthroplasty, uh, Hip, uh, Indian Society. Please, Dr. Dana Sekara, uh, continue with the to case, total hip arthroplasty in acute acetabular fractures. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to talk about uh, total hip arthroplasty in acute acetabular fractures. Uh, am I audible, Dr. Rajiv? Yes. Okay. So this is a 75-year-old lady, uh, bilateral fracture neck with left side acetabular fracture. So she had a shoulder fracture as well. She had a, a CT scan which shows uh, posterior wall and posterior column fracture. The shoulder and uh, right hip was treated with a hemiarthroplasty and fixation. So now we have to do the left hip uh, surgery. So uh, what do you think uh, we should do for her? Any opinion, uh, Mirnal, uh, Dr. Rajiv, Oliver? So it's a posterior wall and posterior column fracture, acute fracture in an elderly lady, uh, osteoporosis. Uh, so we thought we'll stabilize the posterior column and uh, do a pre press fit cup. So we went ahead, open posteriorly, stabilized the posterior wall and column with uh, two plates. But the fracture uh, bone quality was very poor, very osteoporotic. So we used the femoral head to uh, graft the uh, bone defects, especially the medial defect. And um, we used a dual mobility cup. Sorry, I'm in the Dubai airport. There is some... <laughs> uh, distraction here yeah. so please bear with me oh, we, no Hi. we can hear you well yes yeah so Hello. there is a prayer uh, going on now may I have a question so yes uh, oliver uh, which size is this uh cemented acetabular component dual mobility it's a uh, uh dual ability dual mobility i'll show you the post-op x-ray okay so the size. we have to uh size yes Size is uh, 40, it starts from 43, 45. So, because a small patient, I could use a cemented socket. I had uh, did an impaction bone grafting of the socket, uh, sealed all the fracture side with the graft and the medial wall yes. with the graft. And I used a dual mobility socket. So, this is what I could do because of the osteoporotic uh, bone, I could not use a press fit cup. So, this is a case one. Next, I'll say your case two. It's a 72 year old male with a post bypass surgery, acute acetabular fracture with a fracture neck. So, here again, uh, because he had a fracture neck with the acetabulum, 
we opted for a primary thr with fixation so the plan was to fix the posterior column and then try to use a cup it was more like a pelvic discontinuity so i thought I do you know you can attract money in your life yes you can attract money in your life by reprogramming your subconscious mind in fact you can attract anything that you want better job better health better relationship and more hi my name is dr meghna dikshit and for the past 25 years as a doctor i've studied human brain and how it works why success money wealth comes effortlessly for some people while majority of the world struggles with it my triple r technique has helped more than 5 lakh people across the world have healthier happier and productive life create better relationships amazing career having more income streams and much more success in their life if you are someone who would like to learn this simple yet very very powerful scientific technique i invite you to join me on ultimate success builder workshop sign up now for just rupees 99 and you will get more than 6400 worth bonuses completely free so if you are someone who's up for us Quickly click on the link below and register. I will be sharing my 25 years of experience with you just in this few hours to make sure that you rewire your brain for massive success. Quickly click on the link below because the seats are filling up fast and I want to see you inside. And we're back with March Sadness. The team is looking down the barrel of a 455 meeting. They're gassed, Jill. Can they turn it around and make this meeting an email? It's gonna be a tough shot. But whoa there, they're getting an assist from Grammarly. What a play. Grammarly is an AI writing partner that helps you make your point. And watch her finesse this bill. She's adjusting the tone beautifully. Take a look at that, Jill. It really sounds like her. No substitutions. She's got a clear shot and it's good. They're giving it the full court press now. Ellis is using grand. Copy. If we are able to get a good solid fixation, we can use and get the inferior screws and the screws in all the three bones. So ideally, I would like to have a press fit cup, but sometimes an elderly patient and patient with distorted anatomy like this, I will use a cage. And you always so cement a dual mobility? Yeah, if I use a dual mobility, I always cement it. And uh, on the cage, you can even do, uh, cement a dual mobility or you can use a cemented liner on the T-mask liner or one of the uncemented socket with a thick uh, mm -hmm. plastic. You have mentioned something very important. I mean, in the literature, you can see that this kind of reconstruction uh, have a very high rate of failure. Uh, but if yes. you use this low demand old patients, yes. maybe it's a, it's a good option. But uh, remember that yes. this construction, yes. this uh, structure has a very high rate failure rate. So what is the rehab? So in the younger patient, we keep them non-weight bearing for at least three months. So uh, minimum three months is the time which the astablum is uh, healing and consolidating. So we need to keep them. They are up and sitting and walking, but non-weight bearing. But so usually, the, yeah, usually yeah. in old patients, you need to immediately start with weight bearing. Yeah. So that's very important. Yeah. And, and also, uh, you have to remember that these cages do not have any kind of, of integration with the bone at the back yeah. because it's you know polished. So this this uh, you have to individualize this kind of, uh, of implants. Yes, it's only for elderly low demand patients, not for everybody. Okay. So I will show me the show the last case. This is again an elderly female with the acute astabular fracture. So the total pelvic discontinuity. But unfortunately, she had bilateral virus knees with this external rotation deformity. She had a tropic ulcer on the lateral malleolus. So we told uh, we better heal the ulcer and then we'll take her up for surgery. So by the time there was a lot of callus formation. So she presented to us like this. And uh, this is a pelvic discontinuity situation. Uh, Mimnal, what will you do for her? She is a pretty elderly lady. Probably, I'll do a grafting and cup, uh, means the cage with a cemented line and a sem maybe a to, cemented stem as well. A, yeah, to put a cup, uh, cup cage construct with minimal uh, established size should be more than 50, 50, 54 is the smallest cage. 
So no, no, I'll not use like, a cage. I'll just use a cage with a cemented liner and bone graft. Yeah. So, but is a total discontinuity. Unless you use a cup cage, it won't stay there. Mm. It's a bit tricky situation. A huge gap in the posterior column. More than a two centimeter gap is there. It's a pelvic discontinuity situation. So, I thought I'll use a distraction technique. I will use a, a tantalum cup distracted. There is some amount of callus holding the uh, uh, stablum with uh, some fibrous tissue. So I'll have to distract and uh, we'll fix uh, the, all the three bones with the uh, screws. This is the introp uh, imaging. In the uh, introp video, you can see the discontinuity. That the superior mm -hmm. ilium looks separate from the inferior part. Okay. So there's a huge gap. So we use this uh, tantalum. Uh, yes. Then, Shikhar, what, yeah. what was the placement of your distraction uh, screws? So I used uh, um, uh, superiorly in the ilium and inferiorly in the ischium. These are the two, pla ischium, the two places. Right. Right. Yeah. So these are two places where you can use a uh, screw and distract. So this is a cup I used. I removed the uh, uh, the shell so that I can place the screws close to the rim. So these are the additional screw screw holes I had to drill it uh, with a high speed burr. These are very close to the uh, rim. And it is placed and we distracted and we got fixation into, into the ilium, ischium and the pubis, all the three bones. We packed some bone grafts and again I cemented a dual mobility inside. And I had to do a trochanteric osteotomy because the uh, hip was very high riding. It was hitching on the superior part of the uh, superior part of the fracture site. So I had to do a, a trochanteric osteotomy to get the exposure. There's a dual mobility ML type system. So this is after reduction. It was quite stable after the uh, reduction. You have to refix the, the trochanter. Which was fixed with the tension band. This is the socket with the screw fixation. You can see the multiple screw fixation has been done both in the ilium and the ischium. So it went on to heal. This is a six months post operative x ray. The, I allowed weight bearing walking after three months and uh, she is uh, ambulating comfortably. Any comments? Very good. Very, very good fixation. Yeah. 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 Shaker, uh, huh? Solid. Yes. Yeah. Nice, nice case and nice outcome. How do you decide how much uh, in a discontinuity, how much medialize or lateralize you have to keep the cup? How, what is the anatomical landmark on which you can decide? The one is the tal, but in a stabler fracture, tal is distracted. So at least here we can see the tal is uh, close to the anatomical uh, location. So we start with the tal and then uh, start uh, distracting with trial cups and then check under the image. So how much we need to mobilize. Uh, once you are uh, happy with the trial, we go one or two sizes up so that you get a press fit there and then we don't uh, go medial. So like a protrusion scenario where you template and go one size up, same scenario here, you do a trialing and go at least uh, one size or two size up so that you don't medialize and you get a press. Um, I, have, I, have a <clears throat> um, I have a question. Um, yes. The the fracture on the Ramos inferior of the os issue was there before also or uh, because yes. in some cases we observe that uh, due to the forces uh, that are transmitted to, to the rest of the medial pelvis, uh, there are like uh, fractures that occur in in the second place. I will go back to my initial. Really? <clears throat> I'm myself not clear. I forgot. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's there. It's there. Yeah, it's also you can there. see it's... it was there. Yeah. Yeah, it was. There. Okay, so it was yeah. from the situation before. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Was, you Excellent, doc, uh, doctor. Uh, yeah. If, uh, I I need to. Move to the questions to the uh, auditory. Yep. I don't know. Excellent cases. Excellent cases, Dr. Dana Sekara. Thank you so much. I think uh, it will be a good webinar, uh, uh, trying to cover all the topics about total hip arthroplasty in these cases, difficult cases with uh, acetabular problems. Uh, I don't know if you, we have some questions from the 
auditory. No question from the audience. In the meantime, in the meantime, may I ask you something? Yeah, perfect. I mean, Oliver. as CICOT is a global society, I think there are some economical issues that are so important when you choose the best option for these complex cases. So uh, do you think this have any influence? Because Marco show very nice uh, custom made uh, as a tabulum and you show very nice cage reconstruction. So what do you think? I mean, do you think there is any kind of uh, influence of these economical issues in the final decision? Yes. Like I showed the case where I used allograft and did a femoral head allografting in a neglected four-year-old. Probably today's uh, scenario, I would do a custom flange cup in that. But the patient should be affording. So it doesn't uh, it actually matters a lot in our part of the world. Uh, if, you the, if, 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 if you look at the economic part of it, probably the, the best uh, uh, suitable implant uh, for our patients is the cup and cage. Uh, because that is the, uh, amongst all other options, is the cheapest option. Uh, Dr. Danasikara talked about the arthro extractions is a good option. Uh, it's probably not so expensive. Uh, and it, it, it goes well in, in some cases, and it's, it's a good option. But for sure, I'm going to talk uh, about all these cases. If you uh, usually use 3D uh, tomography, uh, to to plan and to select your 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 hardware. Um, Oliver, thank you for your comment. Uh, I know that uh, even in our country, it's not that every patient gets the custom made implant. So we are very well aware that we also use cup and cage uh, uh, constructs. But uh, I know from many companies that they try to um, to provide a much cheaper 3D implanted custom made implants uh, from a CT scan also not with uh, such a long time as it's now like six weeks or four weeks so I think in the future maybe we can also provide similar um, stability with much less costs than having to combine so, so many different like uh, screws and this and cup and so so I think I, I think at the end if it would be a cost neutral thing um i think a, a monoblock implant with a with a, a a proper also outside structure and everything would be maybe the the, the most uh, stable uh, uh, solution but of course at the moment it's not possible in 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 all parts of the world to provide these 3d implants i'm i'm well aware of that uh, and the, the solutions that the colleagues showed from india are very very good techniques and very nice results so so i think you should also keep this in mind maybe maybe in the future marco uh, as many hospitals actually are doing as a research you can do it by yourself i mean in your department you can do a 3d printing metal uh, uh, personalized custom made uh, reconstruction i mean many hospitals are doing that now as a as a as a research but maybe in the future this will reduce the cost a lot so um Dr. Danasikara. So now we have a 3D printing, uh, custom made 3D printing in India. They can do it at a very low cost and they can do it within one week. So you get a, a scanner grams, they do a 3D printing within one week. So we have started using it and uh, we need to wait for uh, some long term um, uh, results. It's a highly porous surface. Uh, they say it might osteointegrate, so, but we need to wait and see. So that makes it uh, more interesting now. But otherwise, a uh, fixation with the cage, with the bone drafting is the best way to restore the bone in these young patients. They cannot afford. And if they can afford fixation, uh, porocoat fixation with the combined plating and the bone drafting is what we opt for. Even our patient cannot afford a tantalum cup. Not every patient can afford it. Yeah. Uh, another question for all the panel. In your hospital, who's in charge of these fractures? This Polytraumatized uh, uh, a patient comes and uh, are you in church or are the trauma guys are in church or you go go to the OR combining? So I will take the question first. Um, in our hospital, the trauma team is in charge. Isolated establishment fractures, they are going to uh, fix it. If there is a neck with the stablum in a, a borderline uh, case, like a 60 year old. Uh, there's a borderline indication for fixation or uh, arthroplasty. They refer the patients to us. 
So we do a combined fixation or I can individually fix it and then do a THR. It's not no issue. Uh, so that's how it work out, works out in our team. Nico. I think that's how it works everywhere else also. Yep. Nico, I think I think the arthroplasty part should be done by by arthroplasty surgeons for sure. But um, in my area, I mean, there is a, a split between the cases that you need a very early fixation, acute fixation. In that case, maybe the trauma team will do it. And the other one that need maybe a delay or maybe are very old and you need to do a conservative treatment at the very beginning and then try to uh, find out if you need a, a, a replacement. So I think the, the arthroplasty is so complex that it should be done by arthroplasty team. Yeah, that, I think it's, it's the, the final message. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, we are uh, things running on time. Thank you all of you. Excellent, excellent topics, excellent lectures. Uh, hope to see you soon in Belgrade. We are all invited. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you. Bye. Bye. Orthopedic Society. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Nicole. you so much. Yeah.